Okay, tonight is the first start of um, a topic called Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes. And um, <clears throat> it, it, this is not going to be, <clears throat> in many cases, an in-depth Bible study. The, the whole point of the, of the class that I'm trying to get across is that we sometimes read the Bible, and because of where we're from, uh, particularly the Western Hemisphere, but even geographically, uh, what is um, perceived to be biblical in one person's eyes takes on a different meaning for somebody else. And I'm, I'm not here to tell you that one is right and the other is wrong or, or anything like that. I'm just pointing out differences so that we can take the shutters that we have, the, the lenses that we have when we read and take those away so that we can read the Bible a little bit more deeply. Um, <clears throat> I know for a fact, as a Yankee, um, I came to New Mexico and West Texas, and it was an eye opener. We've mentioned this before, um, I'm just going to use this as a kind of an example as, to start. I grew up in Yankee land where dancing was just a part of life. Nora grew up in New Mexico land where Church of Christ, Church of Christ, Christ land <laughs> and dancing was not uh, looked upon. So her mother got beat almost to death by her father because she was trying to tap dance on a chicken roof one time. And so we came at it from two, diff two different places. We went to Florida right after we got married and they asked us to be youth ministers. And so we said, yeah, sure. What have we got to lose? <clears throat> That was our first mistake. <laughs> Second mistake, they said, because we got there in January, so May rolled around pretty quick, and it was high school graduation time. <clears throat> and the elders said, we don't want our kids dancing. So we're, we want to keep them away from that high school prom, because that, that's evil things happen there. We, and Nora went, I heard it. I understand it. And I'm going, what? <laughs> then they said, here's what we do. We have all night activities for them. And then in the morning, all the elders cook breakfast for them. And so we said, that sounds good. Except for we got to the beach where they were holding it. And all the girls in their little teeny tiny bikinis <laughs> and all the boys went out into the water. And all you saw was two heads like this and two heads over here. And I'm sure they weren't dancing. That would, have, that would have been wrong. So we said, hmm, Florida handles things differently than we do. So we're aware of things like that, that, that happen that way. But we're gonna start looking at some things. I'm gonna give you this term, first of all. I don't know if any of you have read it yet. But those mores, those social conventions that dictate behaviors that are appropriate or inappropriate, like I was just saying, can vary according to location. But they are folk ways of central importance that are accepted without question. They go without asking. There are things that we know in our lives that just on a moral level just go without asking. Can you think, can you think of one? Okay, I'll give you one. Okay. During the Vietnam War, you don't kill babies. I don't care if it is a war, you don't kill babies. Most people are going to say that's right. Can you think of any others that go without saying? The 
This is hard, isn't it? <laughs> not to think of specific shoes. Um, should we protect the innocent and the vulnerable? Goes without saying. You shouldn't hurt them. You should help them. So there are things like that that are that go without saying. And that, that's the kind of thing that we're going to look at because we think things go without saying. It's just understood because it's in the Bible. And we're going to find out that sometimes the way we read that isn't necessarily accurate. If you will, turn to uh, Revelation chapter 3. We'll look at verses 15 and 16. A minute to get there. <clears throat> Anybody want to read it? What were the verses? 15 and 16 of chapter 3. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot, cold nor hot. I wish you were one, either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Okay, question. What's the point of that? What's what's being said to the Lay out the scenes. You need to make a choice. You need to leave. Leave to me when I read it. Be passionate. You need to be committed. 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 Yeah. Make a choice. Be, don't yeah. choose sides. Don't even know the history. Why would Why would he say that? Because they weren't. Nope. <laughs> It had particular significance to the people of the time. <clears throat> Laodicea was here. Hierapolis, Hierapolis was here. And Colossae was here. They had cold water. And they had hot water. And they used viaducts to get the cold water and the hot water to the city. The city built those deals. By the time the hot water got here, it wasn't hot anymore. By the time the cold water got here, it ran like, not. this is nine miles from here to here. By the time it ran that far, it wasn't hot and it wasn't cold. It was lukewarm. And so that had a, a particular significance <clears throat> to the people there. Um, when, <clears throat> I don't know if you know this, that the message is a, is a version of the Bible a lot of people use. It was translated by a, a man by the name of Peterson. And um, Peterson coined this phrase. He, he called it the uh, Laodicean spectrum. And while we look at it as, as a spiritual commitment, um, the, the point that was trying to be made there was that um, things that we say are definitely commitment oriented. Yes, he may be talking about commitment and I'm gonna talk about this before and later. There, there may be a statement here and a statement here and <clears throat> we may pick up part of it and that part will be true, but so will this other part. And, but we ignore those and bear with me. We'll get to an, an example. Um, I'm going to give you an English lecture here, just as a kind of an example. Um, we, we, we say that things go without being said. I'm going to give you a word, metonymy. This is an English teacher word. Anybody know what metonymy is? Okay. I'm going to give you an example. It's a word that's associated with something and represents it. For instance, in England, you may have heard the crown is going to, and the crown refers to the king or the queen. So, the crown isn't doing anything. 
when you say the crown is or the crown did, <coughs> it's that person. There's another one related to that called synecdoche. And I'm not going to do all this all the time. This is just to get us started. Synecdoche is similar to that. <coughs> um, your dad was a rancher. Right. Did he ever hire a hand? Yeah. A hand? Yeah. I That's know. all you got? Him? Yeah. A hand. Yeah. He didn't hire a hand. He hired a man. A ranch hand. Who hopefully ranch had hand. two hands. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't hire a hand. He hired hands, probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we say those kind of things all the time because it goes without saying when you say a hired hand, you know what you, you picture mm -hmm. a man. And we do the same thing in the Bible. In our minds, we know what that says, what that means. But to the readers or to people in another culture, that brings up a different thing. Um, I didn't, I'm not even going to get into connotation and demotation with you. <laughs> Just for that. <laughs> right. Denotation is the literal <laughs> definition of a word. If I say snake, it, the definition is going to define snake. But connotation is what you picture. So if I said, look, there's a snake, you're going to either see a garden snake, a rattlesnake, a boa constrictor. You're going you're gonna to visualize whatever snake worries you the most if you do that. And so we drag denotations and we drag connotations into our readings of the Bible. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to give you another, one more example. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, 12 and 13. 1 Timothy 2, verses 12 and 13. I'm not going to read that. I wondered. <laughs> Go ahead, Jared. <laughs> okay, I'll read I'm it. young and dumb, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll read it for you. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. Now, what do we pick up in the church? In that scripture, that women shouldn't talk in church, shouldn't lead, shouldn't teach class, really? yeah, teach men. yeah, yeah, really. Mm -hmm. You know what I read? Adam was formed first, and Eve second. Yeah, that was just verse thirteen. That went twice. <laughs> <laughs> in that culture. There's a term called primogenitor. Primogenitor is the fact that the firstborn mm -hmm. is the one that gets the inheritance. And he's the firstborn and he gets that right because he was born first. And in that culture, if you were a woman and you were born first, it didn't count. Mm -hmm. It only counts here where we've given in to, no, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <clears throat> okay. Think about this. Think of all the sayings in America that we have. Um, like, no one remembers who finishes second. We say things like, second place is like kissing your sister. Or, for, or first loser. <laughs> or first loser. Or first loser. Yeah. Or a tie is like kissing your sister. Yeah. <laughs> and we say things like, if you aren't the lead dog, the view never changes. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You're always be behind. Now let's talk about Esau and Jacob. And <clears throat> tell me the story briefly. 
They were twins. They were twins. Who came out first? Esau. 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 Mm -hmm. When Jacob came out and he was given a special name, when Jacob came out, what was he doing? He was holding on to oh, Esau. He was holding on to the heel, trying to drag him back Esau. in. No. <laughs> <laughs> now. <laughs> Um, I don't. I don't know if we need to read the whole story of Genesis, but if you look at Genesis chapter twenty-five, verses twenty through thirty, you're going to see a couple things that that I'll point out to you, rather than us just read uh, all ten of those verses. That whole story. I'll go ahead. And let's read them. Anybody want to read twenty through thirty? I mean, yeah, 20 through 30, 10 verses. Which chapter are you starting in? Genesis 25. 25. 22 through 30 or 20? 25, 20 through 30. When Isaac was 40 years old, he married Rebecca, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean from Padan Aram, and the sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac pleaded with the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was unable to have children. The Lord answered Isaac's prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant with twins. But the two children struggled with each other in her womb. So she went to ask the Lord about it. Why is this happening to me, she asked. And the Lord told her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve your younger son. And when the time came to give birth, Rebekah discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red at birth and covered with thick hair like a fur coat, of course. So they named him Esau. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So they named him Jacob. Okay. Now, <clears throat> who... Um... I've never seen a baby covered with hair. No, that's disgusting. There was conflict from the very beginning. In, while she was pregnant, they were fighting each other. And we don't normally pick up on the conflict part of it. We don't, we don't read that. Who did the father love and who did the mother love? Father loved Esau and the mother loved Jacob. Right. Even that was conflict. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> we don't pick up on the conflict part of this. We don't look at it and, and say, this is a story about conflict. We do a little just because you had one son who traded off his heritage, his primogenitor rights mm -hmm. for a pot of green soup. Now, so <clears throat> he's a lousy son. I don't care if he is first. Mm -hmm. And he was a lousy son. And <clears throat> when they look at that story, they look at it and pull things out of it that we don't normally talk about and pick out. Because we want to focus on the ultimate hero, the one who wound up being the good son, who was not the first son. And we, and we want to draw parallels and explanations for that. Um, <clears throat> if I want to make this, I'm tying this into the Timothy thing too. <clears throat> the male who was first, the male who was first in that culture, how did they perceive him? Well, he's the head of the family after the dad. He was more deserving, right? Yeah. But more important. Was he better? It doesn't say that males are more deserving, does it? We say that. We say males are more deserving because in our Western culture, that's how we translated that. But he, he wasn't the firstborn. They see the firstborn as most deserving. Let's try another one. Tell me about the prodigal. I'm going to let two of you tell me the 
key points of the prodigal son. Nobody knows the story of the prodigal son. <laughs> the youngest was lost, but then was restored to the family. And he wasn't the he wasn't the oldest. He was the youngest. Why was he lost? He also took his money and, and walked away from the family and squandered all of it. And, and, uh, yeah. Kind of disowned his whole family. I'll bet you. If I ask each one of you separately, you'd all say pretty much the same thing, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. Do you know in Eastern culture, do you know what they get out of that story? Not, none of you, none of you, I promise, would have mentioned the famine. Why did the boy go? There had been a famine. And he took his money to leave to avoid the famine. And he wound up being lost. But the story in Eastern culture for the people in that area was despite the famine, which caused the boy to be lost, God was faithful to the boy and saved him. They picked up on the famine and they tell the story from the point of the view of the famine rather from the fact that he sinned and was wasteful and pig and all that other, all that other kind of stuff. They see it as a story of a famine came and despite all the things that happened in the famine, wastefulness and, and, all, and all the people who died and everything else. Out of that famine, God saved. And that's what was important. And we don't ever, I mean, ask anybody. Nobody will ever tell you that story and say, you know, the famine really was important in that story. They skip it. Where does it mention the famine? Oh, I, I just... Yeah, yeah, in verse 14, and after he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country. Mm -hmm. yeah. He began to be in need. So right. he went and hired himself up to see him. And so... I never even realized that there was a famine. Right, yeah. I, you know, I, I, maybe it's because we've never lived in famine. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly right. Uh -huh. when, <clears throat> um, when ministers go to places in Africa or um, even places like Russia or someplace where they've, where they've experienced a really bad famine. And you know, you see the stories on TV about famines that last for almost a decade and they're terrible. And <clears throat> we don't, they, they see that because they've lived it, they recognize it. And that's part of their culture. And because their culture sees that, they tell that story a different way. It, it, the, the story of God comes to them from a different viewpoint. This seems like the famine happened after he left, though. Well, mm -hmm. it did. Okay. Yeah. But despite, but it's read what it says about the famine. Well, I'll start in 13. Not long after the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth and wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. And the, the deal is, that, again, they pick up on the, on the famine. Yes, he went away and he did all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But despite the famine, despite what made him do, um, not despite, after he did all those other things and he was at his lowest point, when he was no lower than he could be, the famine came, but he still was saved. And maybe because of that famine, that famine was what sitting back home to his father, maybe like hard times send us back home to God. And let's let's talk about this. <clears throat> and you you said this and you may not 
have meant to say it that way, but it, it comes across that way when we study these things. You said he was lost. Because we call it the lost. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but he wasn't really lost. He knew where he was. <laughs> but God knew where he God knew where he was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And God was faithful to take care of him. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in hard times. Um yeah. <clears throat> a lot of this, like I said, is introductory, just get us thinking this way. <clears throat> Um, I have a story of a, a minister who went to Indonesia and he was teaching at a Christian college at this uh, Indonesian college. And like any professor, he gave tests and he handed out his first multiple choice test. And when he got the first paper back, he looked at it and a lot of them weren't answered. And then he looked at the second one and they weren't answered. And they'd answer some, but a lot of them were not answered. And he, next day, he said, I'm, I'm not going to grade these. I'm going to ask you a question. Why did you not answer these? I, I said true, false. I meant multiple choice. I'm sorry. I lied. <laughs> multiple choice. They didn't answer them. And they said, this is supposed to be a test about our knowledge, right? And he said, yes. He said, we didn't know him. He said, well, yes, you would have got some right. Pick C. You know, that's what they always <laughs> yeah, tell you to do. C, yeah. And they said, no, that would be a lie. We would be trying to deceive you into thinking we know it. If we don't know it, you need to teach it to us. And can you imagine students in an American school saying, no, we didn't know it, so we didn't answer it. We're not going to get credit for something we didn't know. And by the way, teach us. <laughs> you obviously didn't. Now, their thought was the Bible tells us to be honest, truthful. We didn't know that. And so we're not going to tell you that we did when we didn't. And we have things like that that happen all the time. So <clears throat> now I'm going to start the actual lesson. Okay. That was just to get our heads <laughs> straight. Um, talking about these mores, um, have you ever heard the, the <laughs> saying, don't smoke, drink, cuss? or chew or run around with girls that do. <laughs> You've heard that, right? Mm -hmm. No? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have heard that. <laughs> okay. But that's really old <laughs> Did people take that seriously? Probably. They said, there's got to be truth in there. Mm -hmm. Why? Does the Bible say we should cuss? No. Drink? No. All the other bad habits? No. And we don't want a woman who's going to do that because she'll corrupt me. Right? So we have this whole thing because the Bible says so. And we, we're pulling stuff out of that that may not be right. Um, I mean, what's it say in... I think it's 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It says, our bodies are a temple. temple. And so we shouldn't do any of those things. How many times have you been told that? You know, we, there's, there's just a, an unspoken thing that we should not do with that. Um, what is this? Ephesians 4.29. I'll just tell you. Ephesians 4.29 says, don't let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Mm -hmm. That takes care of the cussing. Yeah. <laughs> the temple thing handles a couple other things. 1 Corinthians 15 says, bad company corrupts good character. That takes care of the 
That's your secret. The gal that does. <laughs> and so sometimes we we accept them without question, and they go because they're just understood to be right and may not, in fact, be. Um, let's talk some more about that a little bit. <clears throat> Um, how were you raised thinking about playing cards? That was great. Yeah, my house, everybody, did. Yeah, right. did. everybody played cards. My grandparents did not because that was associated with poker mm -hmm. and right. gambling. gambling. And, mm -hmm. Yes. And it was, dominoes were okay. Yeah. The cards were not. That's yeah. right. Yeah. There are certain areas in the South, particularly, but other places in the United States. I need a drink, sorry. <clears throat> that drinking, I mean, that's bad. Um, <clears throat> we already told you about Nora and the, and the prom. <clears throat> I'm gonna, Nora now has a red car that she did not want initially. Tell them why. Because my grandmother said, Good girls don't wear red dresses or drive red cars. <laughs> and, and we've been married 54 years and she's <laughs> never had a red dress. <laughs> now, those things, those things become ingrained. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Unless we say unless we blue says, cars. No unless we... <laughs> just make our opinion the opinion with everybody else. I don't care if Jared and Amy drive a red car. We don't, we don't worry. <laughs> so you're good? We're good. I, mean, I don't own a red dress either. <laughs> so you're a good girl. <laughs> <laughs> Amy's a good girl. Yeah. I just, I don't think there's anything wrong with us having those thoughts, just like my grandmother saying that. Um, I don't know. As long as we're not associating it with a salvation issue. Well, and judging I mean, other people. Yeah, not judging it, no. Right. Yes. Unless you're trying to say the Bible says women shouldn't drive red cars and wear red dresses. Oh, right. But if you're just saying <clears throat> women shouldn't, then yeah. that's your opinion. Yeah. My well, grandmother also said when I was getting married, has your mother talked to you about the darker side of marriage? <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody has sex and you're not, you know, you're on the dark side, living that darker side. Of me. I just don't think it's wrong to take that wisdom from people that we grew up with, even though just like you were saying with the cards and everything, you know, but now you look at that and go, you know, bless her heart. But um, I, I just don't think it's. And unless you take that and say, oh, ooh, she's got a red dress. She's, she's loose. Or which is something your grandma, your mother, your grandmother would have said loose. Yeah. But I mean, judging, like you said, judging people based on those is on one those, thing. But I um, grew up with yeah, Ellie, you want to ask you a question? Um, when you were an elder, were you told not to smoke? You wouldn't have smoked anyway, probably before. before. But I'm just saying, Nora's church, you could be anything you wanted, but you just couldn't smoke in the building. You could mm -hmm. go outside, yeah. Yeah. and everybody had to take a knife to cut through the smoke to get to their vehicle. When I was growing up, all the, all the men smoked outside. Oh, yeah, that's my grandparents. But I mean, all of them has, did. Has that changed? But women didn't smoke. Well, it's changed because it's then. kind of against the law now. Yeah. <laughs> just no, but I'm just saying that there really was, a, like you said, a more that, that just said, nice women don't smoke in public. Or did. Kind of like the red dress. Yeah. Or did. <laughs> There, <laughs> there was a uh, preacher one time that at their church they condemned adultery because it led to smoking. Oh, oh, my, God. God. oh my goodness. And it, and it wasn't. <laughs> I'll tell you later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're being recorded. 
Yeah. Um, this is Dewey Howard, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Try this. In some parts of the United States, I can guarantee you this would raise a problem. Around here, not so. If you send out a Christmas card with your children standing with their rifles over a dead buck, <laughs> you're a hero. Look, my son's 12 and he got a 12 pointer. But do that up north somewhere and you're gonna have some sort of a ASPCA or what's the other group? PETA or somebody coming down on you here. So things do change and they change over time as well, like we've just talked about. Mm -hmm. But they are things that change. Um, let me give you one last on this. Um, two, actually. There used to be a time when, uh, when I first came here, nobody talked, even if they did it, nobody talked out loud about sharing a gla glass of wine with a friend. Mm -hmm. Now, I bet you go over to the college class or some of the younger adult classes and talk to them and say, do you drink wine with your meal? And they'll joke about it, but they'll say, yeah, I, Paul told Timothy is good for your stomach. So, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot of people that say that's wrong. And then another one. Now, here's how things can change. Just as an example, if I say that's a good dog, what do you think it means here? It's a well-behaved dog. Well-behaved dog. Medium. If you go to Australia and you say that's a good dog, what's it going to mean? To eat. Oh, good. Good to eat. They herd, <laughs> it's a good sheep dog. A good sheep dog. It's going to herd the animals. Yeah. Now, if you go to Thailand, and I can testify, you, you say that's a good dog, you're talking about flavor. Because it's not uncommon for them to do that, to eat that. So those are examples of how we do those kind of things. And we want to look a little bit about some of the um, unique situations that we have. Um, Americans, by and large, are dualistic in our thought. It's either good or bad, right or wrong. And we, we don't tolerate too much of the gray. in between the gray stuff. But <clears throat> just some history for you. When the Puritans came to America, and some of you have traveled to these places and you know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> when the Puritans came to America, there was a preacher who stood at a podium and he talked and the pews ran this, the benches ran this way. They weren't pews, they were benches. The benches ran this way and the benches ran this way. Who sat over here? Men. 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 Who Men. sat over Men. there? Women. Women. They didn't sit together and there was no, um, there was a separation for whatever reason, they, they thought that, that there needed to be. Now, <clears throat> as time went on, some of the preachers started to develop a theatrical approach to it, where they would not stand behind the podium, they would walk. And little by little, the churches stopped doing that and started doing like a movie theater with the pews and everybody sat in where they wanted. But here's the kicker to that. In the early times in America, the rich people bought their seats. And the more money you paid, you sat up front and the less money, the further back you got. The poor people literally had to stand outside and wait 
till the rich people were seated and then they were allowed to come in. And the church has changed how it does things like that over time because it's more accepted. I'm not saying they were wrong and we were right or vice versa. Now, what, um, what kind of things do we say in our, in the church now that, um, could be bad in another country, but good here. Can you think of any? I'm gonna tell a story and I'm gonna to to clean it up because I talked with Bruce Smith and he warned me, he said, you probably shouldn't say this, but I will. Because <clears throat> I think I know you all well enough. <clears throat> I read a story of a, uh, minister and his wife who went to England. And they um, had a long flight and they were tired. The British minister and his wife picked them up and um, met them and said, okay, we'll take you to the hotel. I'm sure you're tired. So let's just get in the car and we'll go. And the American woman said, well, good. I'm just going to put my fanny right down here. And the English minister's wife was beside herself. She was aghast. And I don't know, any of you know why? She used that word. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. word fanny yeah. in England refers to female body parts. And she was offended highly. So that's maybe one example. We, I mean, we know people that their names are Fanny. In fact, I was dusting one of Nora's Indian pots and it was, it was made by a, a Navajo woman named Fanny White Goat. And so, I mean, it's just a common name here, but over there, it's extremely dirty. I apologize to anybody who's listening. <laughs> now, <clears throat> Can you think of any others? I know going overseas, because I did let's start talking in Europe for about six weeks. Um, you do have, there are cultural things that you have to be aware of and things that can be offensive, such as that, that you don't know. And if you don't speak the language, it's even more challenging. Of course, being in England, that's a little bit different. But like being in Hungary, where we were, there were certain things that you couldn't say or you couldn't do at church because, you know, it just was offensive. But then we also had, that was the first time I ever had real wine for communion. Mm -hmm. I had never had wine before. Don't care for it either. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, I just remember tasting really bitter and was like, oh, this is not, I mean, it's just the custom and stuff that they use. Um, it just, uh, yeah, I grew up as a Lutheran. I was an older boy, and it, my job was to fill those cups with the wine and yeah. take it up to the pastor and stuff. And so it was a shock to me when I got grape juice. <laughs> 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 so in in Indonesia, um, I keep saying that, but another example is to them, billiards are. Uh, bad play pool and to us it's nothing um you know i think of in um the middle middle east the dress code that they have with women being covered i mean if you're gonna be any kind of influence on anyone over there then you cover as a woman you cover your head but that's that's just expected there it's more where it's not here you know but i mean that's just being considerate of their culture i guess when mm -hmm. but it's how they perceive it is how they, mm -hmm. like the red dress i mean they would think if you went around with your head uncovered then you're not a good girl yeah 
So the, the woman, for an example, that was in Iran that was killed by the enforcers of the religious code, it was because she wouldn't cover her hair. And you know, she wouldn't wear the, the covering over her head. Tell you another story real quick, and then we're getting close to it. We have three minutes. Um, the this minister that I was talking about that um, I'm using the book that he wrote, he um, had a, a church uh, where he was overseas. And there was a young couple there that they were just wonderful. Everybody liked them, they, you know, and they were just good. And some visitors came and when the visitors came, they recognized him and said, why are they here? And they said, why shouldn't they be? And they said, they ran away and got and they eloped. And the minister said, what's wrong with eloping? I mean, that's, a lot of people do that. That's a pretty good thing. You know, saves all kinds of money for the parents. <laughs> you know, and so he said, no, in our culture, you obey your parents and the parents said they couldn't do that can you imagine your kids <laughs> and you said no you can't do this you're 21 you know you can't run away and elope i mean talk about a fight unless you're better at raising your kids than we were <laughs> yeah. we are, it's, it, it's real really a problem in culture for the marriages have to be arranged by the parents, mm -hmm. and uh, if you buck if you buck the parents' decisions about who you can marry, then and run off and low who you want to marry, well, then that's that's major problem. I I don't know if I can get through this. I hope you'll bear with me. Um, <clears throat> I should say this and start with it the next week, but as an example, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, what was the problem there? Doing hmm? whatever made them happy, doing whatever they wanted to, not following any laws or moral mm -hmm. codes. Mm -hmm. Pride. Mm -hmm. Were any of you going to say homosexuality? I was just going to say sexual perversion because it wasn't just that it was they were wanted they wanted his daughter first but okay um <clears throat> in ezekiel chapter 16 verse 49 if you want to write it down and look at it later <clears throat> it says now this was the sin of your sister sodom she and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. The sin there was not taking care of people, not being hospitable. And so on one hand, the Bible says, this was the sin. They were inhospitable. Now, does it say anywhere else in the Bible that homosexuality is wrong? Mm -hmm. Yes. Was that part of that story? Yes. And it goes back to what I was telling you earlier. There can be two points in that story. And in the, in the Eastern culture, hospitality is a big thing. I mean, like Japan, you know it. Hospitality is a big thing. A lot of countries, Mexico's that way, when we send people down for a mission trip, those people go out of their way to, to get things, make it ready for people, and they have nothing, but they're ready to share it. And so <clears throat> I will get to this about pride, and because pride, at the end of it, is the thing that causes us to do most of the things. Like, I want it, I'm going to get it, and it's all about me. And, and that's the, the end result of, for a lot of the sin issues that we have in the world. But they're also at the root, the root of some of the biblical things that we do as well and how we read them. So <clears throat> um, I, I may drive you away. 
But the next topic is actually, uh, and it won't take long, maybe 10 minutes, is on sex. And then <laughs> the next, the next one after that, that is money. And then after that is food. So next week we're going to be talking about sex, money, and food. Can we wait till after Christmas to talk about food? <laughs> Please. <laughs> oh, we're going to talk about. To we're going to talk about the biblical concept. Of food. Yeah. Okay. No, it's okay. When we're all on those diets. All righty. I appreciate your uh, attention, and I hope I didn't drive anybody away. Come back next week. Thank <laughs> you.